Welcome to the One Big Thing Podcast, where inspiration meets transformation. I'm Steve Campbell, your host, and I invite you to embark on this exhilarating journey with me. Are you searching for that extra spark, that push to propel you in the right direction? Look no further. The One Big Thing is all about bringing you incredible guests from diverse backgrounds. So picture this, professional athletes, visionary business leaders, fellow podcasters, and even awe-inspiring stay-at-home moms who are all conquering life's challenges. Get ready to seize your moment of greatness. Don't miss out. Subscribe and follow the One Big Thing podcast today. Well, welcome back to the One Big Thing podcast. I am your host, uh, Steve Campbell. Got another exciting and yet maybe eye-opening conversation today. Uh, Joining me in the studio is Netta Gorman. Uh, For those of you who aren't familiar, again, we'll take some time right here at the beginning to allow her to introduce herself. Um, Whether you're a fan of Netta and her podcast, or you followed her online and her journey, or you are brand new to the One Big Thing podcast, This is an interview style show. It's a storytelling show where my job as the host is to pull the best parts out of people's life and experiences to help you as a listener realize that life is not always this rosy picture that you see on social media and on the internet, but there's real people that go through real things, but there can still be success, triumph, and victory in it. So Netta is going to share a little bit of her story. Uh, If you're new to the One Big Thing podcast, though, I hope that this isn't your last stop, that you would even subscribe and listen to the previous guests I've had because they've all had just incredible, unique stories that I think, again, the One Big Thing is all about helping you move the ball forward in your life. Uh, So Netta, welcome to the One Big Thing podcast. Uh, For those that may not know you, do you want to give us a very, you know, high level overview of who you are and what you do? Yes, thank you for having me. So my name is Netta Gorman. You can hear that I'm originally from the UK, but I've actually been living in French-speaking Quebec in Canada for about 35 years. Um, And my sort of brand, as it were, it's not really a brand, but uh, my thing is teaching people how to stop eating sugar. And you wouldn't think that it's a thing to teach how to stop eating sugar, but it's actually a really big deal. Uh, It was for me, certainly, and it is for many, many people. And and the big deal that that comes before cutting sugar is even entertaining the idea that you need to cut sugar or that it's even possible. (laughs) And sort of my role really is to inspire people and to help them shift their belief system about sugar and their mindset and reframe life after sugar for what it is, which instead of what they imagine it is, right? They imagine it's a joyless life full of self-restriction and denial. (laughs) And the opposite is true. The opposite is true. It's freedom, it's peace, and it's joy. Well, and that's the thing I love about podcasts, you know, with you living where you live, um, it would be very hard for us to meet up for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea. Uh, But on a podcast, we can put two microphones in front of us and uh, have a very thought provoking conversation um, to bring to listeners. And I think what I'm excited about with you as a guest today is leading up to this show, uh, many of my guests have talked about things like parenting, uh, marriage, uh, professional development. Brett um, spent an entire episode talking about really what is what is what is wealth and what is our identity. They've been very high level, almost hard to grasp concepts. That it's like, yeah, we all want to know who we who we are and what our purpose is and how to be the best spouse and the best parent. And then there's Netta, who wants to talk <laughs> about life after sugar which is an extremely practical uh, way of life. And, um, you know, leading up to this show, you and I had talked about maybe some of my health journey too. And I think this is going to be a fun episode because, again, for our listeners that are in their late 20s, 30s, and 40s, in the thick of the crazy season of life of raising kids, being parents, You know, you're at sports fields, you're at basketball courts, you're at dance recitals, you are constantly on the go, which means that you are grabbing whatever your kids eat, you're grabbing snacks, you're eating maybe not the healthiest foods because you just don't have time to always slow down and cook, which leads to a lot of fatigue. It leads to a lot of anxiety. It leads to a lot of um, feeling hopelessness. And we don't realize many times that's tied to our nutrition and what we eat. So why don't you help us, you know, understand your brand? 
from from what I know is Life After Sugar. You host your own podcast. It has been wildly successful. It is very niche specific where you have guests on talking about their journey of Life After Sugar. So if you hear part of Netta's story today and you want more, head over to Apple, to any podcast platform, subscribe to her Life After Sugar and hear the stories of what people have experienced as they've learned to cut what has been such a staple of many of our lives growing up, which is sugar. And so you didn't just probably get to where you are today, nor did I. Why don't you help us understand kind of a little bit of your journey and what led you to this point today? Okay. All right. Well, um, your listeners need to know that I'm slightly older than your general public, as it were. So um, I'm 53 and um, I have a 15-year-old daughter um, and um, I've been with my husband for getting on for 23 years. Um, and so, uh, yes, and this came about, this whole life after sugar thing came about um, around my mid-40s. So ever since my early 30s, I'd been having all kinds of health issues, not weight issues, I have to say, not necessarily weight issues. I've, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, the the... I don't know, I suppose it's genetic or something, to be relatively slim and have been all my life. But I was getting weight creep. I got pregnant later on in life after lots of different medical procedures. And um, that didn't help with my weight. But it wasn't my main problem. My main problem was my digestion, my headaches, my mental health. Um, and basically, I got to my mid-40s and I felt like crap. Right, no pun intended, but my digestion. <laughs> I had chronic constipation. I was going to the bathroom once a week. Once a week um, is toxic for your body. I felt awful. And the doctors kept telling me, you know, eat more fiber, eat more fiber, but it was actually making everything worse. And at the end of the day, I think the fiber products that they were asking me to eat were full of sugar anyway. But, you know, I, I never put two and two together ever that my diet had anything to do with just how, ba just how bad I felt. Um, it was all about the fiber. I could tell it wasn't helping, but I couldn't have, I couldn't find any other alternative. And um, I have nothing against my doctor. He's lovely, but, you know, it wasn't helping. So um, eventually I got some advice to cut sugar and flour and sweeteners for two weeks, not from my doctor, but from a nutritional therapist. Um, and I just said, no, no way. <laughs> Are you crazy? Like, why would I do something like that? What, like, what has sugar, flour and sweeteners? What? That's in everything. So uh, you're basically asking me to stop eating or what? You know? And plus, I felt so bad that comfort foods were my only comfort. Mm. And it was like someone coming along and saying, oh, you feel bad? Here, let me cut all the sources of comfort in your life. <laughs> you know? So I resisted. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Give me a proper solution. And in the end, you know what happened? I didn't change anything. And nothing changed. Right. And so um, after a while, I got over myself. <laughs> <laughs> which I highly recommend people <laughs> to think about doing, I got over myself um, and I said to myself, look, you know, things aren't getting better. I've never tried this. I can do anything for two weeks, surely. You know, I've traveled around the world. I've changed countries. I, You know, I've held down a good teaching career for getting on for 30 years. Surely I can give this a try for two weeks. And then my other bit of my brain said, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, but I did it anyway. And that's the other piece of advice I would have for people. Do it anyway. Even if you don't believe in it, even if you don't think it's going to work, even if you can't see the point, give it a try. Yeah. Well, and, and, I, and there's so many people that I come across in my life that aren't 
they're just not happy with themselves. They're, they're not happy with the decisions that they make, the choices that they make. Um, and, and many times it stems from those comforts that you talked about. When you are down and out, when you are exhausted, what many of us culturally do, because it makes us feel good in the moment is we reach for things that aren't together good for us. Whether that is um, a season of my life where, man, every time I needed a pick-me-up, I just felt like it's time to go to Starbucks. And you just get in the car and you go to Starbucks and you feel like, okay, I feel better. Um, for some people, it could be you know extremes of alcohol. It could be whatever. But if, if we're not careful, we can have these vices in the form of comfort that can actually be negating the life that's on the other side of breakthrough, which you're trying to discuss. And it doesn't always mean that everyone is carrying extra weight. Um, there may be people that just have really bad habitual habits of overeating too much. And it is this cycle that is so detrimental that, you know, in many of your areas of your life, maybe you've experienced breakthrough in parenthood, or maybe you've done other things. But when it comes to this one area of your life, you're almost addicted to food. It's almost like you have to have it or you don't, and you can't stop yourself. And I know this may sound extreme, but I have to imagine that there's a listener out there that's nodding their head and being like, how do, how do they know? How do they know that I make really bad decisions when I'm by myself or I'm with my spouse? And so I think, you know, coming back to this journey of discovery of these two weeks, what What has been this process like for you of not only going on this journey yourself and basically like, what have you experienced? But then as you've started this podcast, Life After Sugar, what has been maybe the unintended like side effects of this life change? And now this community of people you've come along, what's been that experience been like for you? It's been life changing, transformational, Mm -hmm. not just for me, but for the people that I help. And it is unexpectedly transformational because, as you were saying, we reach out for, well, I don't even call them foods, but I used to believe that they were foods, all the chocolate and the ice cream and the cookies and all the comfort foods. Um, We reach out for them to usually to fill some kind of totally valid emotional need, the need for comfort, the need for reward, all totally valid. But we don't think about what we're doing or why we're doing it. And this was the case for me as well, in the case for many people that I help. And I think that thinking about things is highly underrated in our modern society and stopping and slowing down to think about things. It's it's like a vicious cycle because we don't have time to do that when, as you were saying, we are running around with kids and activities and getting our lives underway. And you know, and that was the case for me. I didn't stop to think. And when I stopped sugar, flour and sweetness for that two week period, um, despite my best intentions, I was forced to stop and think about my body, about my habits, about what I wanted in life, like big existential questions that you wouldn't think would, would sort of crop up when you're just stopping sugar and flour, I have to say, which is a, you know, quite a bit, it's kind of mind blowing for people to, they understand why sugar and the sugary foods, but they're like, but why flour? Why not bread, bagels, crackers? What's wrong with them? They're staples. What do you, people ask me, what do you eat in your sandwich? Right. And I'm like, but I don't eat sandwiches anymore because I don't eat bread. So it's actually funny enough, This whole switch required me and requires people I help in Life After Sugar to change how they see not just their food, but their whole life. Like, you know, and I cannot overstate the transformational nature of that reframe that it requires of you. And probably that's why I fought it so hard because who wants to sit and think all day, you know? In fact, what happens is, You replace, really, you don't have to sit and think all day. You replace lots of um, automatic habits, right, by other automatic habits because your new habits eventually become automatic as well. And not eating sugar, flour, and sweetness becomes automatic. 
What has this um, journey been like? So you said that you help people. Um, I am a firm believer of championing people that are doing very cool things. And I told you before we came on, shamelessly plug as many things as you want to because you really are helping people. So you have the Life After Sugar podcast, which anybody can subscribe to for free. But I believe that you also provide uh, coaching or oversight to individuals. Like wh- what does that look like? And if you know a listener of this podcast was interested, like what, what is involved with something? Something like that. Well, yes, because you may have all the info. I could give you all the info. It's all out there on YouTube and whatnot about what foods contain sugar, what types of sugar there are, how to spot hidden sugars on labels. All the info is out there. Mm-hmm. But what trips people up and what tripped me up, because I didn't have any guidance at the time, this was in 2015, um, was actually implementing all that info and that is what I help people do. So I've got a membership, a monthly membership, a bit like Amazon Prime, if you will, but about sugar, um, where people pay a monthly fee and then they get access to all the resources. And and not just resources about the info about sugar, but actual assignments and exercises that I ask you to do. And, you know, I've been a teacher for 30 years, a teacher of young adults in a college here in Quebec. And so I, I... kind of know how to get people to to do things that are good for them as it were hard hard but good for you that actually require you to think and make a, a real change so um in my in the membership which is called the after sugar club um that's what people get they get access to the resources but they also get access to two calls with me a month i call them check in calls where we actually it's i suppose you could call it coaching i'm not officially a coach I'm a teacher but that is where the magic happens in those calls where you know I sort of push you gently nudge give you nudges to actually make real day-to-day deep changes and sustainable changes and for those people who need more guidance because some of us really do then I have my um, 12 week or 90 day program which is called Freedom from Cravings Formula, which is actually opening soon at the end of November. Now, I've given it several times to several small groups. It's specifically geared to women over 50, but I've actually got people in there much younger than that. And I say over 50 because usually that's when we start having time to think of ourselves and to take care of ourselves, especially mothers, Um, But honestly, if you get there earlier in your life, more power to you. Come on in. And really, it's it's weekly calls with me. And I actually hold your hand and guide you through all of those um, assignments and exercises and videos I've made. And I have a structure to it. It's a formula to help you over 12 weeks get to freedom from cravings. And then you get a year in the membership for free anyway included for for implementation because it takes time. You know, we tend to want to do things overnight, but this takes time. In your, if you're not a tech person, the only thing I can think of while you're talking is you, you, if you're listening, you may think, okay, so if I just cut these few things, I'm going to free up you know, mental capacity and do other things. And the apps, the answer is absolutely yes. And if it's hard for you to conceptualize, like how does it actually work? If you've ever been on a computer and you've hit that wonderful control alt delete, there is a a function called a task manager. And when you open a task, I'm not a techie person. When you open task manager on your computer, it actually shows you all the apps that are currently running on your computer, whether you are actually interfacing with them in real time or they're running in the background. It shows you how much data and how much memory and how much energy it is taking to run those programs and functions. And if you've never looked at it before, it is actually fairly shocking when you see what seems like harmless apps are actually consuming the majority of the data on your computer. And that if you will actually close that program, how much faster your computer will run. Okay, what does that have to do with sugar? Maybe you're an iPhone user. If you actually hold your phone down on the home screen, it will actually reveal how many apps are running in the background on your phone at one time. And if you've never done this before, it's actually kind of... um, uh, um, 
you enjoy it because you have the ability to now go through and literally close every app that's been open. And you may think like, well, what does this have to do with anything? Even the things that we don't see in life could be sucking energy in data from us, whether they are conscious or whether they are mindsets. And you may not realize that that small window of time throughout the day that you continue to make unhealthy choices, even though it might seem so small and so minuscule, is actually jeopardizing and sabotaging the other parts of your day that you don't realize, which when you wake up in the morning and you have back pain or you have migraines or joint discomfort or um, you know brain fog. You literally, whether you're a mom, which I totally get moms, I absolutely love you as a dad to four kids under seven. My wife is a rock star and my best friend. I understand how hard it is to be a stay-at-home parent. If you're a dad, there's just times when you're raising kids where you can't remember a thing. Brain fog is real. I mean, you can't remember a story. You can't remember details. And what if you actually realize that it has to stem from what you're consuming via food and what you're intaking and not just food, um, drinks, sodas, there is so much sugar. And I think what I was excited about um, as part of this journey with you, Netta, talking today is what I love about your story, which was very similar to Dana Kasperson, who I had as a guest on this show. She was a world-renowned, award-winning choreographer and dancer. And literally went to an event and uh, that was a dance studio. And at that dance studio, there was a gentleman there that talked about conflict and how to use or, you know, dance as a means to overcome conflict. And a light bulb went off for her. She did not come into that event thinking about conflict. She was just at the right place at the right time, gathered new information and realized this is part of my purpose. This is my passion. And that launched her into writing a book about the 17 ways to overcome conflict. She is now doing TED Talks. And I think it's kind of cool because it's part of your story too. You've been a teacher for over 30 years and in 2015 discovered life after sugar. And you now have an after sugar club, which I feel like you guys need jackets. You know what I mean? Like just to get people excited. But you have members, you have people that are subscribing to Netta Gorman and your strategies. And it's you didn't go to school for this. You literally just got to a place where a friend or somebody said to you, Netta, you might want to consider cutting out these things, the nutritionist, and you did. And now you have a podcast and now you are helping inspire so many people. So why do I say all of this? There are so many people out there that, that, that feel stuck. They feel unnoticed. They feel forgotten. They feel less than. They're seeing what everybody else is doing and, and constantly, whether they admit it or not, measuring themselves with a barometer of how successful they are, how much money they have. And it may not always be tied to what you do for a living. It might actually be tied to a passion that you have on the side that that we just never know when opportunity is going to strike for us to do something that could completely, you know, you, you probably couldn't have called when you started 2015 that year, that all these years later, you are going to be hosting a podcast and doing what you're doing. So like, what does that, what does that journey? Cause I'm curious, what does that journey look like for you? So obviously you cut the sugars, the sweeteners, the flowers for two weeks. Like how did you get to a point that you just discovered, wow, there's a real need out there to have somebody step in and offer, you know, coaching or membership. Like what was that process? How long did it take you to actually say from inception of an idea, like I could do this to like actually doing it? Like what helps yeah. somebody that needs a spark that's been sitting on this idea for a long time and they just, whether it's doubt, whether it's, I don't know if I can do this, like how did you teacher 30 plus years get to this point of being a podcaster in life after sugar yes and i'm still a teacher yes though, right well yes um here's the thing i thought it was going to be for two weeks right and i could handle as i was saying i could handle doing anything for two weeks and then um i felt so good i mean it, it wasn't a smooth two weeks i had the detox symptoms and it you know in the first week but then after the second week I felt so much better. I decided to carry on another week, another week, another week. And and it's like I was being relatively public about it, just on my own Facebook 
pet wall, you know, I'm not at all well known at the time. And, and people were like, it was attracting attention. People were saying, how are you doing this and continuing to do this? And I was like, well, I just feel so much better. And I just want to see how far I can push this thing. Anyway, I like the attention as well, I have to say. <laughs> but anyway, I think to answer your original question, it took about three years for me to realize, oh, this is a thing. Because then, because I was doing this in French, like I, I live in a French speaking community, like province in Cannes, it's not just a pro- community, it's a whole province, with millions of people who speak French in Quebec. And I started to give um, in-person workshops about three years into my journey. And I also got into the press, into the papers and stuff. And um, I built a little website, which I say that, but you know what it's like building a website. You don't do it overnight. It took me six months just to figure out, you know, how to make a homepage. But um, I started to sell little online courses and I started a membership in French and people were in half the people were interested and half the people were you're crazy. <laughs> I got all sorts of input and it's like, why are you doing this? You're crazy. And the other half was, why are you, why would I do this? I'm curious to see how much better I can feel. Because as you were saying, for all the times that you lack energy and you have the brain fog and everything else, um, what if that was down to not just what you eat, but specifically to what you eat that that contains sugar? And again, I add flour because that turns into glucose really fast in your blood, just from the fact that it's in powder form and that it's high in starch. So, yeah, and then, you know, keto came along around 2018. And I thought, oh, these are, you know, this is, these are my people. And then I quickly realized that, no, I'm not keto. I don't, (laughs) I'm not into keto. It's just a whole bunch of rules to replace other, another bunch of rules. And I'm not into following rules anyway. So, uh, but the good thing about keto is that at least it got sugar free life out of the closet and and sort of normalized it slightly but then then came along all the keto sweeteners so in my point of view it 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 sort of fell off my radar anyway so and then I had to spend a year telling people I wasn't keto but anyway then I switched over to English because it's my language and because there's just a bigger pool of people that I can help And that's when I decided, oh, you know, I'd like to start a podcast. And I started that in January, I think it was January 2020, because I'm coming up to its third year. Um, And then I started a membership, my membership after Sugar Club in English, and then the, the program. So that's how it came to be. It's because I saw that I could help people and not just help them by telling them, what contains sugar and, you know, the the effects of sugar and then the positive effects, more energy, less brain fog of not eating sugar, I I could also help them with the deeper change. Because if we didn't have this emotional connection to sugar and comfort foods, we, you know, we could just come along and tell you, well, just stop eating it and you'd stop eating it and that would be that. But We know, this is what I'm saying, you know, you have the info, you know what sugar does to you, okay? And if you don't, I can tell you what it it does to the brain and the body and your gut. But knowing the info isn't enough. And what I help with is not just the knowledge as a teacher, it's also the implementation, the actual doing the things you need to do to change how you relate to sugar. And that is thanks to my eight years of living life, actually living it, craving free, sugar free, flour free. And the operative word there is free. I think what you just did um, a little while ago too is raise such a great point that seems so obvious on the surface, but yet many people don't practice it, which is just really taking the time to think about what we're doing, 
what we're saying, um, what mindsets that we are choosing to believe in. We can, um, just like driving a car, um, go from our house to wherever. And we didn't, we don't even remember how we got there. Uh, we just, we just did it autonomously. And I think I did an episode, uh, with a good friend of mine, Spencer, uh, and he had talked about, um, on his episode, um, basically taking hold of thoughts. And when you have these, um, thoughts, you know, whether they're mostly negative, probably when we say that, cause you don't spend a lot of time talking about positive thoughts and breaking through. It's more so what I call stinking thinking. You have these thoughts about yourself, these thoughts about your spouse, your family, your extended family, your job that are not rooted in being thankful, blessed, and grateful, but they are in, um, just very negative, um, tones taking hold of that and really thinking of that. And just because a thought comes to your head doesn't mean that it necessarily originated with you, right? Because there's competing factors that are happening. But when you have a thought that comes to your head that you're you know, not pretty enough, or you have body dysphoria, or um, you just don't feel like you're measuring up as the parent or the spouse, just take 30 seconds and think about, like, talk to yourself, maybe not out loud if you don't want to be crazy, but this is a this is an active practice that I do where when a thought comes to my mind that I'm just not sure where it came from, I'll park there for a second and be like, now wait a minute. Like, where did that come from? And you know, it might have stemmed from a conversation I just had. And this is the after effect. It may have been um just something that you need to take hold of. So I love that you just broke it down so simply that for those that aren't familiar with keto, it's just a way of, of life where you eat high fat foods and you reduce sugar and you put your body into ketosis by after being consistent with eating high fat foods and, you know, basically removing carbs, your body begins to rewire itself. It begins to reset. Um, in, in, I, whether you're for it or not, I think what it is though, is it's a change. It's a discipline. It gets you out of a mode of, I don't like myself, I'm overweight, or I'm not overweight, but I just have cravings, or I just don't feel good. I don't want to be in a bathing suit. I don't want to go to the gym. I don't want to get out of bed. I'm depressed. Those are all real things that we many times don't have the space to really talk about. If you want to break free from that, then you have to do something different. You are not going to literally wake up today and just have positive thoughts and say, I'm going to go change my life. Many times it takes a disruptive action to get you out of it, whether that's keto, whether that's being mindful of sugar, whether that's developing a hobby, whether that's getting counseling, because you just realize, man, you have been affected by your upbringing or things that have happened. You need to do something different. And we, we just, we're all believe that we're more capable of things. And sometimes if we're being honest, that we're not, and whether it's keto, whether it's life after sugar, I think what this episode is going to do today of whether you've been in this lifestyle like Netta and you can raise your hand and say, I've never felt better, or you just came on this episode to support her or because you found it in your podcast list and you wanted to give it a shot. Take, take this information for what it is. Um, you know, because I think it can be very life giving and life changing that what if these small habits of reducing sugar, and I want to get into the practicality of this to help kind of paint a picture of where people are, uh, the practicality of it is so life changing, but I think what we struggle with, um, you know, as parents, as, you know, as spouses is maybe you are a Monday warrior. You went to bed Sunday night wanting life change. You woke up on Monday and said, today I'm going to start eating clean, you know, and then Wednesday night, you know, you go out with friends and, you know, the menu is put in front of you and you're like, ah, shoot, all right, I'm going to get, you know, this and I'm going to eat that. And then you do that and you start fresh. And then three days later, you're hungry. So you reach for things like what, how do you begin to unwind or create consistency, because I would have to imagine that as you begin to reduce sugar, the whole idea for that two weeks was to really not have sugar, sweeteners, and flour, because you almost have to detox, like you said, your body from having those things. So like, what what are some practical things that if somebody said, I'm willing to do this, but I also have kids at home I have to feed. I also have a spouse that may not have listened to this episode and just loves candy. Like they're not going to want to do this with me. Like how, how do you, what does it look like steps wise to begin to see this change? 
All right. Well, I think the first thing to think is that what goes into your mouth doesn't go into others' mouths and what goes into their mouths doesn't go into yours. So what you decide to do for yourself, um, everyone else around you, including your family, doesn't have to do the exact same thing. So that already, I think, is some kind of self-sabotaging behavior or thought where you're like, well, I can't do this because my spouse won't do it, my kids won't do it. It's like, well, it's your mouth and it's your body, Mm -hmm. right? So nobody followed me when I did this. Nobody. (laughs) I was the odd one out and I kind of enjoy being the odd one out. So that suits my personality anyway. But, you know, if if your family members, your spouse and close family members, um, if I... In my way of seeing things, if they love you, they want you to feel good. The reality is that they can love you and still unwittingly want to sabotage you because it makes them uncomfortable. Oh. And then we get into a lot of dynamics there where th- these things come out, you know, during um, the time when I give my program where the people are like, well, my spouse wants to support me, but he brought home candies. Or, you know, I asked him not to, but he did. And, you know, he forgot or whatever. So there's a whole bunch of conversations that need to happen when you make this type of choice. But the bottom line is you're making a choice for yourself. And it may feel selfish to do that. And and if so, so be it. (laughs) In a way, there's nothing wrong with being selfish. You're looking after yourself. It's a form of self-care. And so, but practically speaking, really what it comes down to is eating what I call food, (laughs) real whole foods, which really, especially in North America, as opposed to prepackaged, highly processed food products or edible products that are created in a lab, engineered by the food industry or what for what passes for food. And so that is the biggest mindset shift at the beginning is to redefine what food is. And especially I found in the USA, but also in Canada and Europe, our, we've sort of lost touch with what food is, what our definition of food is. And so we, it's really difficult to reframe what, food is and that it feels like there's not a lot of choice out there once you decide to cut out all the prepackaged processed foods right all that's left and I put all in air quotes all that's left is uh, meat fish or proteins if you're an omnivore or plant-based proteins if you're vegetarian vegetables fruit dairy products, and and I include fermented dairy, especially because I'm big on fermented foods and drinks, Um, eggs, nuts, seeds. It's like, is that it? You know, is that all there is? And that very thought I had for the longest time as well, I thought I was just going to be eating ice cubes for the rest of my life at the beginning, you know, what's left? But I think that very thought of, well, is that all there is? shows really how we relate to food and how we see all those products as being food. Once you step out of that paradigm of, you know, seeing all those processed products as food, when you go back to basics, as it were, you don't have to go all the way back to paleo times, right? It's only for the last 60, 70 years or so. If you look at real foods, then you can actually make hundreds of thousands of combinations with real food ingredients. And what I like to say is that look for foods that are ingredients and not for products that have ingredients or a list of ingredients. And that's kind of a good starting point. If your food has a you know food label or an ingredients list, then instead of wasting time trying to figure out the labels, just put it back on the shelf and go head over to the produce section and the fresh meat, fish, protein sections, whatever. And, you you know, you it requires you to use a little bit of imagination for how you can put all the whole food ingredients together for making different meals. Are there any um, 
because I think again, I'm I'm just a big believer on being super practical. Um, I think you just got extremely practical. What you put in your mouth is what goes in your mouth, not another. Make the food be the ingredient, not with the box. Um, or do you ever subscribe to two things, um, meal prepping and being prepared in, are there any, um, sources of maybe meals that somebody can look at a book? Because I think maybe where, where the breakthrough happens is somebody can listen and be inspired and, and almost be jealous, uh, in a, in a healthy way of, I want to experience what Netta's experienced, but I, maybe I start off really strong tomorrow. And then by dinner time you know, I fell short because family dinner came. And I would say it's because we just weren't prepared. We didn't make a plan. You know, we were inspired, but there was no like critical thinking as to like, how am I going to pull this off? And it may be, it may be getting to a point where you're so tired of being tired that, that you've been looking for something. Maybe it's been, um, you've been supplanting, you know, your, your vice with something else. You buy way too much stuff on Amazon because you just hope that buying another purchase is going to fill a need and then the purchase comes in and you feel empty. Maybe it's you thought it was going to be a hobby and it just wasn't that or getting alone time. What if it's this? You know, what if it's life after mm-hmm. sugar? But I think what you ha- what we all have to do is get to a point of acknowledging I'm tired of feeling a certain way, but put a why behind you want change. Like I, I want to experience life change because I want to be healthy around my kids. I want to be, I want to be positive around my spouse. I want to be the person that when I come into work gives life and energy to my workplace. I want to feel good. I want to look good. I want to sleep well at night. If you put why, but I want to live a long life with my kids. I don't want to die early. Those are all very real things that I think we need to think about why we want to do something and then. And then spend some time, whether you call it meditation or you just sit down by yourself with a cup of coffee or tea and really begin to think about what do I need to think about your life, the busy weeks that you have. You know that every week you have sport, sporting events for your kids. Um, you know that you are somebody who's always on the go or you work late at night. You have to think about those, those parts of your day, those times of your day that um, usually create conflict or like how are you going to overcome those and then, you know, mark those things. And I don't know if anybody else can hear my dog in the background. This is real yeah, life. Please. I got my dog going crazy outside. So bear with me for one minute. We'll get through it. Um, you need to think about those parts of your day where you know maybe where the struggle are and then begin to make a plan around it. Like dinner time is really tough for me with my kids. So so yeah. would you recommend any kind of nutritional books or meals or uh, what about meal prepping? Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you a question back? What is it that you find challenging about meal times? Um, I think with uh, super practical having uh, four kids under seven years old, there is always a difference in you know you can make the healthiest meal that looks great, and your kids are like, "I don't want this. I want mac and cheese," and you're like, "I just." I mean, this is literally a really nice, like gourmet dinner. Why do you want that? Um, you know, so it, I think it's when you have more than one child, it's, they want something different. Each one wants something different. You're just so exhausted that you'll just make whatever the kids want. But truthfully too, then as a parent, it's just super easy to always finish what your kids aren't eating because you don't want to waste food. So the next thing you know, maybe you started off having a healthy dinner and then your kids wasted all the chicken nuggets or whatever, you know, now I feel terrible that I have a lot of food that's got boxes and ingredients on it. Um, you know, and you just, you end up finishing there. So I think it's just, how do you overcome when there's so many mouths to feed? You know, we're not talking about the pressures of extended family being like, Netta, what are you doing? I mean, this is literally just dinner time with your family at nighttime with competing agendas of what everybody wants. So it's just, it's real life and it's hard to overcome because not everybody wants to eat the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been there. I've only got one child, but I get your point and I certainly have been there myself. And um, it's easy to say, well, just eat what you're given because you know until you're old enough to cook for yourself right (laughs) you eat what I cook for you um and actually what sometimes what I did was that that very thing that I just said right my my child was seven when I stopped eating sugar flour and 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 sweeteners and what I would do actually often is 
I'd make the same meals as before, but I'd leave off the flour-based things or the starchy sides for myself. So if it was pasta with something, then I'd make it, but I would leave off the pasta for me. Uh, at the beginning, I wasn't even eating potatoes, although I do now. So same thing for potatoes or fries or whatever. Same thing for rice. So that was pretty easy because it didn't actually change anything that they were eating and it didn't require much effort on my part because I was making those dinners with the starchy sides for years before. So they would still get the same things, my husband, my daughter, and I would just leave those sides off the plate for myself and give myself a bigger portion of, of the protein-based and the veggie-based stuff. Um, another thing that is good that I found was making healthier versions of their favorite, you know, chicken nuggets. I would make myself and sort of cut up chicken breasts and, and fry them over. And it wasn't even, I mean, I could use flour to, to, to cook them over and just not cook in, in a flour based breading, you know, for myself. Um, um, so that was another way of sort of getting around it. Um, and sometimes if my child wants mac and cheese, I'll make it, but not, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't make it as well as different menus for the same meal. And the other thing I had to get used to was that if she refused to eat something, then so be it. And I had to believe, because I was giving her good food the rest of the day, that refusing to eat some dish wouldn't result in her dying of starvation um, and that the whole issue of hunger um, is probably much rarer than we would imagine especially in North America where we are overfed and undernourished in general and so uh, I'm not saying you know don't feed your child far from it what I'm saying actually is um, reframe what we give to our children as being, am I nourishing my child rather than am I just giving them something to chew and swallow? And funnily enough, when you do reduce or cut sugar and flour, that sensation that you have, you and your children, that sensation that we interpret as being hunger um, is not actually hunger because you've been eating three times at the very minimum per day that sensation is very probably a blood sugar spike and crash, which you don't get to that degree when you're not eating foods that spike and crash your blood sugar levels. And that reframe was huge for me. In fact, I realized after just a few days of not eating sugar and flour and sweeteners that, oh, I'm not feeling hungry. I don't want to eat or reach out for snacks. And my child, in within a few weeks or months, at the age of seven or eight, said to me, Mum, can you stop giving me snacks for school? I'm just not hungry because I've eaten a good breakfast. This is like an eight-year-old. I've eaten a good breakfast, nourishing breakfast, eggs, meat, whatever. Um, and I'm eating lunch. And if I snack, I won't be hungry for my meals. <laughs> she got it before the age of 10. But because I slightly changed, yes, what she was eating for breakfast, gone were the cereals and all the sweet stuff. And she was getting, you know, for full fat plain yogurt with some fruit or and bagels with butter and some kind of meat or cream cheese or some kind of fat, good fats into her and proteins, which means just like an adult, her blood sugar wasn't spiked as much right from the beginning of the day. And she wasn't getting hungry. And that was the exact same thing that I experienced and that thousands of people that I've helped have experienced because it's human biology. It's nothing magical. It's human biology. And this is when I started intermittent fasting just naturally from not feeling hungry because I wasn't spiking my blood sugar. And lots and lots of people have told me and have attested to the fact that when you cut all those processed foods, most of which contain sugar or flour, some such form, you naturally feel less hungry. And you're naturally eating more nutritious foods. So again, you're naturally 
less hungry because you're actually nourished. And so are your kids if you let them eat those foods. Well, and I think about, you know, how, especially when you're raising young kids or the more prepared you are for something, the easier it is when the moment comes, it's less stressful. Um, and we don't think about this always with food, but you know, if you need to get around for church in the morning or you need to be at the ball field, it's probably better to lay out the clothes for your kids or even yourself the night before and to know where the cleats are and the baseball glove is and what clothes your kids are going to wear so that when the moment comes the next day, you're not scrambling and you're not taking what should be, a you know, a pre-thought process. And now it's super stressful because you're running late, you can't find, and now your temper's raising and you're yelling at everybody. Um, it's the same thing where if you know you have an appointment, you'll probably prepare or a presentation, you'll prepare ahead of time so that when that moment arises, you are ready to go. If you are waiting till dinner time to figure out what it is you want to eat and looking what's in the fridge, you are probably doing yourself, which I'm guilty of too, a disservice because the moment is getting away from you and now you are more reacting than being proactive. And I want to talk about intermittent fasting here for just a second to help people understand what it is. Um, I have found that for myself, I meal prep and I typically meal prep early in the morning before everybody gets up, you know, whether that's cooking high quality protein, uh, maybe a, a, a good carbohydrate on the side and making enough for three or four days and putting it into containers and having it ready. Because I know my own defaults that when I come home from a long day, it could have been the best day of my life where I got to spend time with Netta Gorman and podcast with her. But then after this, I got three meetings with clients and you know, you come home and you don't realize how much of your day is taking energy from you that you get in your safe space via your home and you're exhausted. The last thing you want to do is when your defenses are down, you probably make bad decisions. Now, I will tell you that in my life, I'm a morning person. When I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I am invincible. My mind is clear. I can do anything. I go to the gym. I plan the day ahead. I can seize life. 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock p.m., Steve, is borderline uh, chaotic and ruthless. Like my mind is mush. I don't make good decisions. I am reactive to every situation. That's when I usually grab sweets or ice cream because my guard is down. I've spent so much of my energy throughout the day that now I just don't have the mental ability to overcome in the moment like I would in the morning. So meal prepping for me helps to make sure that I'm getting inside of me the things that I want to do. But probably one of the the greatest changes in my life was introducing intermittent fasting into my life. Whether you are doing it for health reasons, for spiritual reasons, why don't you, Netta, explain to people intermittent fasting, how it works, because it really can supercharge what we've been talking about this entire time as a compliment. So for somebody who's not familiar, what, how would you describe intermittent fasting? All right. Well, intermittent fasting, actually, we all do it, even though we don't realize it while we sleep, unless you're getting up every couple of hours to go and eat something, which some people do, but most people don't, um, then you're already intermittent fasting. Intermittent means, well, it's also called time restricted eating. It just means that for a certain length of time in a 24 hour period, you're not eating. And it, it kind of seems obvious that, well, of course, for certain periods of time in your day, you're not eating. But it, but apart from the time that we're sleeping, if we look at it really, honestly, <clears throat> especially in the North American um, context, a lot of us graze all through the day. We're eating all the time. And the thing is, every time you eat, Chances are you're spiking your blood sugar levels, which means that in turn you're spiking your insulin to bring down your blood sugar levels again. It should should be called blood glucose levels, not blood sugar, but commonly we call it blood sugar levels. Anyway, the thing with intermittent fasting is that it's really the body's preferred way of functioning and not eating is actually healthy for the body, at least not eating for a certain number of hours within a 24-hour period. It's actually a natural and 
healthy way for the body to function and something that we've sort of moved away from in this, as I call it, overfed and undernourished society that we live in, where all the marketing messages tell us you can't eat just one, um, you know, you you crave this snack, it's crave-worthy, you know. Even nutritionists tell us if you don't eat several times a day, you will break your metabolism or words to that effect. And that is contrary to human biology, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you see it. The bottom line is, if you are actually eating foods that nourish your body, right, that are not produced in a lab or engineered by the food industry, that are real whole foods, sources of protein, good sources of carbs, like vegetables, for example, good sources of fats, that haven't been refined and processed by the food industry, if you're eating real whole foods that nourish you, you probably won't get hungry more than a couple of times a day, if that. And that's pretty mind-blowing for people who believe that you need to eat like a newborn every couple of hours, right? Well, you don't. You're weaned now, (laughs) and you don't need to eat every couple of hours. And if you do feel that you need to eat every couple of hours, have a look at what it is that you're eating that makes you feel hungry every couple of hours. And as I say, that it wasn't just me that had this sort of brain-blowing experience of finding that I wasn't hungry anymore. Not spiking your blood sugar levels by sugar and flour means that your so-called hunger levels are evened out. Your blood sugar levels basically are evened out. Your insulin production is much lower. And this in turn means for most people, they don't feel as hungry as often anymore. And so intermittent fasting really just comes naturally instead of eating three, four, five, six times a day. Naturally, you feel like eating once, twice, maybe three times a day, that's way less than, I suppose, food marketers would have us believe you need. And it's, I think it's hard because of the misunderstanding. And it's also a mindset uh, for my life. I, I learned about the 16-8 window, and that's just something that I've kind of stuck to. So, you know, you eat within an eight-hour window, and then the 16 other hours, which you're thinking, how can I not eat for 16 hours? If you're getting a good eight hours of sleep at night, there's half of your hours. And so what that looks like for me is I will stop eating by 7 p.m., 8 p.m. at night and then not have my next meal till noon the next day. Now, does that mean that I'm I'm hungry in the morning? Sure, it does. But when I have a hunger craving that comes, I also realize that I'm in control of myself. And I'll tell myself like, nope, I'm going to make it till noon. And it's crazy how when you actually acknowledge that your body lets go of the craving. You know, it's not running to the fridge. It's not. So it's a mindset for me. And what I have found is that through um, implementing intermittent fasting, I am more aware about all aspects of my life, not just the food that my mind is sharper. Um, I find that I get a lot of my quality work done early in the morning, whether it's at work or in my personal life, I'm just sharper. It's easier for me to remember multiple tasks at once. Um, When hunger comes, I just, you know, push on and I tell myself I'm okay and it goes away. Um, And for me, uh, weight training has been a huge part of my life. Being an ex division one athlete growing up in sports, I was always under the notion that when you go to the gym early in the morning, the first thing you do coming out of the gym is you chug some kind of protein shake or you need to go eat 25 eggs. And it's not true. What I think is hard though, is um, understanding well-meaning medical journals, uh, health nutritionists, um, even down to a journey that I'll talk about someday down the road is how I changed what I wear on my feet and kind of what's been involved with that. But just when you have well-meaning individuals, doctors, nutritionists, friends that tell you like, nope, this is the way that you have to do it. Why not why not try change? And intermittent fasting is a way that makes you feel more in control and more disciplined that food, which I love that you've said over and over again, we're overfed and undernourished. Food food is not does not have to be a source of pain. It can actually, as my dad always said growing up, food can become a source of fuel that helps your engine to run. 
But just like a car, if you're putting the wrong type of fuel or you're not taking car- care of it, your car cannot function and run. You cannot be the best version of yourself for yourself, your spouse, and your children if you are constantly putting garbage into your body and hoping that this engine of yours is just going to run at high octane. It is not going to happen. Intermittent fasting is a very cool way that if you can begin to implement, maybe it's not a 16-8 window, maybe it's skipping a meal, but it's being conscious of it and why you're doing it because you're wanting to reset your body. There are tons of YouTube videos out there and speakers other than Netta and I that are probably far more qualified to talk about this, uh, intermittent fasting. But don't be afraid to try something different. Um, Consider giving it a try in you know, I'm just thinking about a few things in my life as we bring this, uh, Ned, I'll have you begin to think about your start, stop, continue here for a second as we wind down. What I have found in my own personal journey when it comes to maybe not, I've, I've struggled with life after sugar. I've never totally cut sugar out for eight years of my life because I'm going to be honest, you go to a birthday party, sometimes you want a piece of cake. It's just like hard to sometimes stay super consistent, but I've implemented intermittent fasting and there's definitely been seasons of my life where I've been disciplined. What I have found is the longer, the farther away you get from a decision that you made, meaning that today, this day, I'm going to reduce or cut out sugar in my life. As you get three days out, one week out, two weeks out, 21 days out, six months out, What's wild is how your body begins to reject what something tastes like because you've been starving it of something that you'd be surprised that you will no longer crave candy, sweets, and desserts. Soda, when you begin to kick soda, when you have it six months later, it almost tastes bitter. It's wild how your tongue, your taste buds, your senses will begin to reset to a more natural state that it should shock all of us that when we have it, it's like, oh, this is not good. Mm-hmm. So so I hope that this, um, this episode has inspired you maybe with a different train of thought because this isn't about like being the best parent or the best spouse or being the best worker. It's maybe the thing that's fueling all of that life change, consider life after sugar, you know, subscribe to Netta's podcast. Um, but for those that aren't familiar with the one big thing, we usually go for about an hour. Um, I hope that this has been um, really good information. And I always have each one of my guests walk down this journey of what I call start, stop, continue, where I have each one of them acknowledge something that they want to start doing something that they would like to stop doing, but maybe something that they want to continue doing because it's working well. So Netta, I know I prepared you before this episode. Why don't you give us whatever the statement is and then the action and you can just go all the way through start, stop, continue. All right. All right. Thanks for asking. All right. So I would say that what I'd like to start doing, I kind of already started it in my 50s, is to take care of myself more. And you may think that cutting sugar is part of this and it is, but take care of myself in the sense of, um, uh, I would say, (laughs) um, pardon myself or forgive myself when I'm not perfect. Embrace that imperfection. I think that happens for me at least later in life. And all those times that I was harsh with myself in my younger years, um, I want to start being more compassionate with myself. In my 50s, I'd like to continue helping people. <laughs> uh, there's something amazingly gratifying about helping people to cut sugar because we go, we, they come in thinking we're going to talk about sugar and we end up talking about life and talking about them. And it's so gratifying for myself and for them. So I want to continue helping and having a positive impact with my podcast and with everything I do in life after sugar that's for the continue um and I think uh, you're making me think here (laughs) which is no bad thing but um something that um I suppose something that is important to me what was the third one we got start we got stop and we got continue to stop doing, sorry, something to stop doing, I think is to um, to expect things to go faster than they do and to have unrealistic expectations. I'd like to stop doing that. 
Whether it's for the bits my business or my life or for how other people react or act, that's one big thing for me, to stop having unrealistic expectations and to, to get real about how things are, just accept them as they are. With that, that doesn't mean not being able to change them, but it's to do with my expectation. We could talk for another hour about what you just said, because that is the crux of a lot of our discomfort in life, um, is, is wanting things to go faster, to be more fruit producing early on. And when you have a vision, what I loved about what we talked about as a little recap here on the show is that you had a personal desire. You started on a journey and then had an idea that took you three years to get off the ground. And now you've been podcasting for several years and had all these guests, but that three-year window, um, that's three years, folks. That's not three months. That's not three weeks. That's three years of life. And I think what happens, even for me as a content creator, I get so revved up about these conversations and I feel so good when we're done recording it and I want everybody in the world to hear it and you release it. And sometimes it doesn't reach the amount of people you thought right away. And it's hard not to get down on yourself and, and think that I do something wrong, but you got to, I got to remind myself all the time, Steve, you are competing with the mental space of people that don't have any space to give. You know what I mean? It's not It's not like people are sitting down waiting for this episode to come out. I'd love to get to that point, but you're competing with them raising kids and going to work and listening to their new album that just came out or doing this. Like You're hoping that they're going to stop doing that and listen to your podcast episode. And it's just easy. My wife is my best friend and many times my source of encouragement because I get down. I get discouraged, not just with podcasting, with other areas of my life, trying to eat clean, trying to lift well, trying to take care of myself, you know, having two really good days of eating clean and expecting to lose 10 pounds. Like it doesn't happen. And I think I love that point that you shared because if I probably, for many of us, revealed the, the areas of disappointment in our life, it's that this timetable that we have in our mind or the expectation doesn't always match the experience. And I think it's very hard for us to understand why, because our hearts are in the right place. So I appreciate you sharing that here at the end. And if you have uh, enjoyed this time with Netta, like I have as the host of this show, uh, I always uh, don't forget, you can check the show notes at the bottom of this episode. I will have contact information for Netta, for her website, for her podcast. Get on there, support her, uh, leave a review of this episode. Uh, when you leave a review of an episode on my show or on Netta's show, it just helps the algorithms know that this sh these shows are worth listening to. And I think for both of us, we love helping people. Uh, we love championing other people. And so I just want to thank you for being a guest on my show. Thank you for being open and available. I hope that this show leads to people going to follow you on your journey of life after sugar. But uh Folks, thanks for stopping by The One Big Thing. I hope that this episode has inspired you. And until next time, thanks for being my guest. Mm -hmm.